Okay, more on hypothesis testing. And we got I'm gonna celebrate the character up here, Ronald, Ronald A. Fisher, R. A. Fisher, born in 1890, um, last until 1962, and the bane of the Bayesians' existence. We're gonna talk about the p value here in the context of hypothesis testing and the standards and the traditions and the, of the frequentist perspective owe quite much to, to Professor Fisher here. What I'm about to describe is how he uh, described statistical inference and others in social science, of course, have taken this quite a way. Got some other things up here to identify. This is just a standard error of the proportion one more time. And don't know me that I might have put um, SD associated with this term. I'll check. Standard error of the proportion. Here's got a Z, distribution of Z. Standardizing, in this case, not across observations, but once more uh, across, in past context, uh, across P hats or sample statistics. And using the area of the curve, underneath the curve, to make statistical inferences. I'm going to do an example with coin tossing. Do I have a coin? I don't. So I have a P hat. It's about inference in repeated trials. Um, so you have a P hat is you're observed, heads or tails, in repeated trials. So write that down. And P here, we're going to not have an estimated proportion, but a real one in the sense that we're going to test whether this coin is fair or not, whether it's weighted um, or whether heads and tails actually have an equal probability of coming up whenever you flip it. So we're going to make P equal 0.5, and so some the idea is a fair coin, and are going to wonder if P hat outcomes, a proportion of outcomes in repeated trials will give us something close to 0.5 or not. And our alternative, that's the null hypothesis. The alternative is that P hat won't equal P, that we will be able to conclude uh, with some P value less than 0.05 if we'll be able to conclude that the coin is biased um, and given a result if it's weighted. We're going to have a fun exercise about weighted coins later. So I set this thing up this way. So P hat, this is HO down here. P hat, the difference between what we observe as a proportion in repeated trials, really observed, and what hypothetically we observe, I'll put up here in the numerator of the test statistic, and use this as the denominator. This is PHO, so we're going to use 0.5 here, 0.5 here, 0.5 here, and let's give it a hypothetical number. Point, we're going to say P hat equals 0.5. 5, 3, 1. So, it's close, right? The outcome of the trials is close. What we want to know is that if we kept doing it over and over and over again, would we get something closer to 0.5 or instead distant from it like point? So, this is then equal to 0.031, right? Now we have to decide on how many times we're going to toss the coin. And not coincidentally, I'm going to say we're going to toss it 1,600 times. That's a lot. That's a lot of coin tosses. Each time we're going to record heads as one, tails as zero. So we're speaking then of the probability uh, across the repeated trials of, of finding, finding uh, heads. So equal to one. This is easy. The whole thing I set up to be easy. Um, 0.5 times 0.5. 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. Take the square root of that, and it's 0.5. So what goes up here is 0.5, and what goes down here is 40. The square root of 1,600. And then you have this ratio left to figure out. That's going to be your z-score distributed in this way, and the z-score is going to equal 
if you just do this arithmetic, the z-score is going to equal 2.48. Now we're going to go back over here to the distribution of any standardized uh, anything. It's always normal, a mean zero, and it's standard deviations that we're going to call standard errors. Standard errors, um, you're going to move one away. We're going to think about the area under the curve. I already told you about 95% of the area falls within plus or minus two standard errors of zero. So this is one standard error this way, this is one standard error this way, so on, back the other way. So you have this area left in the curve. And we're going to call this a two-tailed test. And finally, we're going to count the area on this side and the area on this side. What proportion of the area falls under the curve on both on both sides? So two two tail. The reason this is two tail, I can make this one tailed if I change this expression. If I say p hat not equal to p, I didn't say which direction uh, in which p hat would be unequal. I didn't hypothesize, for example, that it would be weighted toward heads or weighted toward tails, I just hypothesized that it would be weighted in some, in some one or the other direction, so I'm going to choose a two-tailed test. For hypotheses where there is a directional, um, sort of natural direction to the hypothesis, you would, you would use one tail, which essentially then would take the results you're going to see here and divide by two. Uh, so you'd be looking at all the area over this way or all of the area over this way, leaving the p-value to describe as you'll see, only one of those twos. In this case, we're going to do, going to do both. So 2.48 is a z-score, and it is associated with a p-value. So it's a z. We're going to see other distributions, not just z. We're going to see the t distribution, and we're going to see the chi-square distribution. And so we'll have a t instead of a z, and we'll have a chi-square instead of a z. Z is the, norm, the normal curve, T is almost normal, and as we'll see, chi-square has many different, um, many different shapes. In every case, though, we're talking about doing integral calculus and finding the area underneath the curve. You don't have to do it. You don't even have to know it. Um, just know how to do it. You just have to, for the purposes of this course, understand finding the area under the curve is an extremely simple, basic um, a uh, basic tool of the calculus, so it's easy and given, and these things are spit out for you with R and other computer statistical packages. Z equals 2.48. That's an extreme value in this distribution. It's extreme. It's out here. Right? And right about 2, exactly at 1.96, the p-value of 0.05, the magic one, is going to appear. And anything more extreme is going to have a p-value that is lower. The p-value in this case, I don't know what it is exactly. I know that it is less than 0.01. The p-value associated with this. And what does the p-value uh, mean? The p-value is the probability, write this down, the probability of a, obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as the one you observed, given the the null hypothesis is true. So once more, given that the null hypothesis is true, P is the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as the one you observed. This is extreme. And we want to know what the probability of observing in subsequent trials, probability of observing something at least that extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true, in this case that the coin is weighted perfectly, that the probability of heads is the same as the probability of tails, which gives you a p of 0.5. So, probability of obtaining something this ex extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true, in subsequent trials, is very, very low. Fisher would say it's statistically significant, this difference that we've observed, and that it's fair then to say, given a standard of 0.05, Given the standard of 0.05, it's fair to say that this, this coin is, is biased, um, that it's weighted versus the ideal of unweighted, an unweighted coin. So, sounds 
clumsy <laughs> is the best word I can think of for the language associated with the frequentist inference model. But you have now down all of the all that you need uh, for a basic understanding of it, and now I'm going to begin the attack on it by telling you that these data aren't ex aren't entirely made up. So we're going to bring in now a fellow from Cornell named Daryl. I put him up so you can can Google him. Daryl Boone is a was a very prominent um, social psychologist at Cornell University. Um, quite famous um, in in his own circles among other social psychologists. Until last year. And then he became famous everywhere. Um, Daryl Ben published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology the, the results from nine experiments, all of which seem to, given this inferential package, suggest that college students at Cornell had, for lack of a better term, ESP. He had been doing this for six or seven years, and keeping it to himself, he might wish he had <laughs> continued to do so. He'd been doing this for six or seven years and keeping it to himself, but he published all of them in a prominent journal, and the referees and the journal editor, this is a very, very prominent journal. It would be, in political science, very similar to uh, the American Political Science Review. It's a home-run publication, um, if, you can, if you can get it. So you the most prominent journal in his field is publishing a very sensational result, um, or a series of very sensational results. I'm going to give you the basic outline of Bem's first experiment, I believe of nine, um, the basic outlines of it, and tell you about his results and what he, what he concluded. There were more. He calls this phenomenon psi. Okay, let's do this. Psi is weird. Parano psi is paranormal. And Google that too. Bem and others, for centuries, forever, have been interested in um, sort of the union of science and odd beliefs, um, beliefs about ESP, beliefs about um, any kind of sort of mythological, anything that can't be proved by physics. So, and that's the basics, basis of his, his psychological and scientific work. The first, he did, did his research at Cornell, using Cornell undergraduates. So I guess if we're to extrapolate and say that there is, are these kinds of things, odd goings on, that they're, they're happening at least uh, only at Cornell, I might say something about the external validity of his study, but I want to critique the statistics of it from the standpoint of a Bayesian, which is where we're going. And then we're going to touch base with Reverend Bayes in the next video and, and then le leave him alone. So, this point five three one is what he found in the following experiment. He sets up um, these a hundred students. That, now the n is not one hundred; it's closer to sixteen hundred because uh, he's count, counting. He's letting students students do multiple uh, repetitions, so he's counting students times the repetitions that they did of the following setup. He has two windows um, that appear on a computer. There are curtains and so forth. Students are are challenged to pick the window uh, that will reveal a photograph. One window will always reveal nothing, and one will reveal a photograph. And the algorithm, the computer algorithm that decides whether a photograph will appear or not appear, chooses at random. So we have very much the setup of the tossing of the coin here, 1,600 times. Parenthetically, I'll say that his N is, to me, controversial simply from a frequentist standpoint, but let's take him at his word and say that it's okay to let 100 students do 16, 16 comparisons and then lump them all together as best I could tell that's what he did. <coughs> so this is a simple task. You're sitting in front of a computer if you're one of his subjects and the window you choose, A or B, and then you get to see whether you got the right thing or the, or the wrong thing. The window opens and you chose, if nothing's behind it, you'll see nothing. If there's a picture there, there'll be a picture, and then he randomly manipulates what the picture will be. The picture is either um, romantic, uh, a romantic encounter, 
um, between people. It's either a romantic encounter or he calls it erotic. So again, we're going to vary whether they can see a picture, and we're going to vary a picture relative to whether it is romantic between two people or erotic, which I suppose is porn, right? And he didn't tell the students that one of those two things was coming. What he wanted to find is whether there was a difference in the probability that they would identify the identify where an actual picture occurred across the random variation of erotic versus romantic. And what he found was that there was. So the probability of, what he found was 0.531 instead of 0.5. Now he's randomly varying these things. So the expectation is 0.5 exactly as we just did this problem. The expectation is 0.5, so the null hypothesis is that they should get the erotic and the romantic at the same rate. And what he finds is very different. He finds not very different, it seems mildly different. 53.1% or p hat of 0.531 instead. So he runs this test, right? And exactly the way we did it to determine whether or not the coin was biased or perfectly weighted. And he comes out at the end. I believe his Z is, is 2.31. And so his N, which is not transparent from his article, um, how he, exactly he did this, but again, it's a little bit less than 1,600, but something near there. And his P is exactly 0.01, meaning that the probability of obtaining a result that extreme, given that the null hypothesis was true, that it's equally likely to, to identify romantic versus, uh, versus erotic. Given that, he's found a statistically significant result. Now, what did it mean in scientific terms? First off, what did it mean substantively? The computer chose whether they were going to get a romantic or an erotic picture after the student chose which window they believed the picture was behind. So, what he's talking about is time going backward, in a sense. There's, there's this evidence of some sort of, of ESP, in a sense that they could anticipate in the future whether that was going to be an erotic versus a romantic photograph, and I suppose become somehow stimulated to be able to see into the future. Statistically significant result, and it caused an uproar. Probably, in my mind, an overdue uproar. Something like this, I think, needed to happen. All over the country, all over the world, people teach this course and never say a word about days. People teach this course and never say a word about something that we won't even get to, which is the likelihood theory of statistical inference. There are, put simply, other ways of doing inference rather than the frequentist, objectivist viewpoint. And the results of Professor Bem's um, Results of Professor Ben's experiments published in the most prestigious journal in the discipline caused a lot of people to take a second look. Um, and that second look continues. In my opinion, going forward, um, there will at least be a complete mix of Bayesian inference and frequentist inference because so many, uh, so many things can go wrong in the model laid out by, by Ron Fisher. He's also the fellow who decided that 1 in 20 uh, is the point at which we would say statistically significant. Some, something of, so this is a statistically significant difference if its p-value goes underneath 0.05, 1 in, 1 in 20. He is a guy who said that, and then everyone else has done it ever since and continues to do it, not just in social psychology, but in political science and elsewhere. And the controversy behind the objectivist, frequentist perspective on this can be resolved a couple of different ways, and the most prominent alternative is going to involve me replacing this character with a fellow by the name of the Reverend Thomas Bayes. That'll be the subject of the next video.